Good afternoon all. Uh, my name is Zahi O'Callag. I'm chair of the UK group in the Institute uh, and I want to welcome you to this session uh, with the Alliance Party. Um, this is one of a number of webinars we've held uh, with the parties in Northern Ireland uh, to get their views on Brexit and in particular on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, regrettably, uh, for personal reasons, Naomi Long uh, can't be with us this afternoon, but I'm delighted to welcome the Deputy Leader of the Alliance Party, Dr. Stephen, Stephen Farry, who is the MP for North Down. Uh, he has a lot of experience in international affairs, a lot of experience in politics in North Down. He was a member at one stage uh, in the executive uh, before it fell, and um, uh, he had, took a very strong role indeed uh, in against Brexit and was strongly in favour of remaining uh, that, uh, in the European Union. Uh, and he has been very active uh, in Parliament in Westminster, uh, not least of Northern Ireland questions, uh, bring, trying to ensure that the, the pro-Remain voice uh, is still heard in Westminster uh, and that those uh, politicians in Northern Ireland who are opposed uh, to what's happening uh, for, by the British government on the protocol, uh, he takes a strong stand on that uh, and he's one of the few voices from Northern Ireland uh, who takes that view. Um, this webinar is on the record. Uh, Dr. Farry will talk for maybe 20, maybe 25 minutes and then he will take questions. Uh, if you're asking a question uh, and you have an affiliation, uh, please let us know. And we will endeavour to uh, have Dr. Farry uh, answer as many questions as possible. Uh, we'll end uh, at two o'clock. Uh, Dr. Farry, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Institute and I hand over to you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, good afternoon uh, to uh, all of our guests. Can I first of all, first of all just apologise on, on two fronts? Um, first, uh, for uh, Naomi, um, who has had some um, very urgent, um, uh, difficult family developments uh, this morning. So sh she's had to withdraw at short notice. Um, so I'm stepping in um, at, that, at that short notice. Uh, so apologies for any ums and errors uh, as I'm sort of um, wor working my way through this um, from, from, a, from a standing start. Uh, and secondly, you, you may notice my voice is a little bit croaky. Um, I'm recovering from illness uh, this week. So this is actually my first, uh, my first day back and um, it's a non-COVID related illness, so other illnesses are apparently are still available. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, kick, I'll kick off. And I, I suppose in terms of approaching the protocol, I suppose the simplest thing to say at the outset is that um, we in the Alliance Party can be probably described as pr uh, protocol pragmatists or protocol realists uh, in, in the sense that we aren't particularly enthusiastic about the protocol. Um, but we understand why it exists and why it is necessary and that we have to make um, the best of it. We certainly know that it brings uh, many challenges um, for um, Northern Ireland uh, and it's far from a perfect solution to the very particular challenges posed uh, by Brexit. But it also provides some um, comparative opportunities um, to us as well, which we need to capitalise upon. But hopefully we'll come to that uh, in, in a moment. And I stress, I, I say comparative because um, there's nothing compared to both the UK and Ireland um, being both part of the European Union. And uh, in any situation where that is broken up, there's always going to be some degree of, of difficulty um, that, that's posed um, um, from that and uh, an economic uh, hit. Uh, this is essentially a situation where Northern Ireland is maybe in a better position relatively speaking to, uh, to other parts of the UK, but in absolute terms, it is still uh, an economic challenge um, for us. Um, and that brings me to, I mean, just to, at the very outset, to just to briefly um, go through a little bit of history of this, but um, but not, not over, over, to overly dwell on history. But to say, obviously, we, we approach this as a, as a pro-European party. It's, we've always been uh, pro-European. Uh, it's very much part of our uh, DNA and that we see, see ourselves part of the wider European and global uh, liberal movement. Um, in Northern Ireland terms, the Alliance Party is a cross-community party, so we don't take a, a particular stance 
on the constitutional question, but we all have members who have a, whole, a broad range of different perspectives in that regard. Um, but we are essentially founded around making Northern Ireland or this place, this, this region, whatever it will be in the future, work and to, to build uh, integration, promote, uh, promote reconciliation uh, and uh, to ensure people have opportunities and, and prosperity. So the, the European Union has been very important uh, to Northern Ireland in, in a number of respects, obviously the economic uh, opportunities, uh, like every other part of the European Union, have been uh, of crucial importance. But at a political level and almost a, a, in a constitutional sense as well, um, the European Union has been extraordinarily helpful. Um, and the fact that both the UK and Ireland were part of the European Union essentially allowed the, the, the Good Friday Agreement to proceed and <clears throat> to be successful uh, in the sense that it allowed borders to essentially wither away. Um, and that provided a, a very important context uh, to um, the Good Friday Agreement. And while people may accurately say that the European Union is barely referenced inside the document on the actual pages, it is very much in the background context to the peace process and to the agreement itself. And in essence, it has respected and reflected that Northern Ireland is still a divided society where a contested space in the sense that there's that overarching uh, constitutional question. And the only way which Northern Ireland can work is through uh, sharing and interdependence. So Northern Ireland and, and uh, benefited from the three-stranded approach to the Good Friday Agreement, um, the uh, internal power sharing, um, the North-South cooperation on the island, and the East-West um, collaboration inside the context of the UK, but also including Ireland as well in a much broader um, framework. And all three of those legs uh, of the stool uh, st stood in harmony um, with each other. But it was that um, development of the single market and the further consolidation of the customs union uh, that allowed borders to essentially um, disappear in that context. And it, it allowed uh, essentially what is the, the, the fundamental trade-off inside the agreement uh, to bed down, where Irish nationalism, um, in, in the broadest sense, formally recognised Northern Ireland as an entity for the first time within the Good Friday Agreement. But there was a very important quid pro quo in the sense that uh, the Irish nationalist identity was recognised and that there was that free freedom on the island uh, to, to do many, many things without uh, really any um, inhibition. And that was uh, of crucial uh, importance to uh, allowing things to develop. Obviously, our peace process has been, um, shall we say, fairly fraught, uh, even with uh, over the past 20 years, even before we got to the context of Brexit, through many um, difficulties around identity issues, around parades, flags, how we deal with the legacy of the past, various differences between the, the political parties over things like language rights. Um, but things did more or less stumble through in, in the main. Uh, but it is a fair criticism to say that we could have done a lot more in terms of building uh, reconciliation and providing an integrated society. So that the full potential of the Good Friday Agreement has not yet been fully, fully realized. We had a long comes Brexit. And up until now, obviously both the UK and Ireland moved in harmony. Uh, in relation to um, the, the relationship with the European Union, um, even in terms of th something like Schengen, where both stayed out at the same time, uh, obviously both within the single market, customs union, the EU itself um, at, at the same time. But, but Brexit itself was the, the great disruptor um, in, in all of this. And the fundamental difficulty posed is that Brexit was trying to provide a very simplistic populist solution a um, black and white solution into a society such as Northern Ireland that up until now has only really survived through various shades of grey and indeed some, some constructive ambiguities. Um, and the notion that um, a Brexit, in particular a hard Brexit, which obviously must entail some degree of an economic interface uh, or a, a border, uh, if you want to call it that, um, wouldn't cause disruption, was always going to be misplaced. And we've been wrestling with that conundrum ever since as to 
exactly where that line on the map was going to be drawn. We would have much preferred a situation where, where there never needed to be any line on the map drawn um, anywhere in, in these islands or any hardening of any existing line on the map. Uh, but that is the, the, the consequence of the decision around Brexit. And that does bring some very profound political, economic and social uh, implications and may in turn pro provide some uh, fairly serious uh, constitutional implications as, as well. And we've been wrestling with those problems uh, ever since um, 2016. I mean, our party initially um, was running a, almost like a three-stranded approach uh, in terms of a hierarchy of, of responses. But our first preference was that we would reconsider Brexit in its entirety, uh, let the people of the UK take the opportunity to reconsider uh, if they seriously did want to with Brexit, particularly in light of some of the developing situations that we've seen since 2016. That never really got much traction, unfortunately. The section op second option was to for the whole UK to work closely align with the single market and customs union. Again, that was sadly uh, rejected. So we were in then to a special deal for, for Northern Ireland, um, whether it was called the backstop or the, the later version of the protocol, there was always going to be what, a, a need for that special arrangement for Northern Ireland once all other options were essentially ruled out um, of, of the table. Um, due to the decisions taken by the Conservative government and for, for many years their, their allies in, in the DUP. Um, so we approached the protocol in the sense that we didn't want it to happen, but we, we recognise why it exists and why it needs to be there. But in essence, um, and in, in saying that, we also recognise that if you had to make a choice, not that we wanted to make a choice, um, the only realistic and viable place where you could manage the interface in these islands was going to be down the Irish Sea, not across the land border. You're talking essentially a choice between seven air and sea crossings versus over 250 land crossings. You're talking about um, uh, a far greater volume of move, a number of movements on the islands compared to what happens across the Irish Sea. And in all circumstances, the only place in which you could ever do the, the SPS uh, IP food checks was going to be down the RSC anyway, because the precedent had already been set in terms of the movement um, of farm um, vehicles and, and live animals previously anyway. Um, and uh, there was no prospect of treating the uh, island of Ireland as separate um, uh, animal health zones in any event. So that was probably the absolute clincher. And it's, it's noticeable that even someone like uh, Shanger Singham, who is one of the, the so-called intellectual godfathers of, of Brexit, even he recognises that when it comes to SPS interface, the only place that could happen is down the RSC. So in terms of um, where we go from, from here, um, we essentially want to turn the, the protocol as much as possible from a solid line down the Irish Sea into a dotted line with as few dots as we possibly can. And in parallel, we then want to see action taken to ensure that we fully capitalise upon the opportunities that are posed to us uh, by, by Brexit. Um, the, 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 or, sorry, by, by the protocol, not, not Brexit, to, to correct myself on that one. Um, the, Probably the, 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 the signature suggestion that we, are, we have made over the past 12 months, and it's something we're going to renew over the coming weeks, is that there should be a UK-EU uh, veterinary agreement. Um, we think that the, the, the trade and cooperation agreement itself um, is uh, obviously a, a, a zero tariff, zero quota deal. Um, but in terms of non-tariff uh, non barriers, it actually is uh, a fairly minimal uh, agreement. And uh, we have seen a situation because the UK is determined to um, have this fiction of its, its own sovereignty and regulatory autonomy, where they didn't go down the line of, uh, of having a, a, a veterinary agreement as part of the trade and cooperation uh, agreement. We see that as a major oversight. And uh, first of all, it penalises all UK agri-food exporters uh, in, uh, to the European Union. And we'll probably see more and more evidence over the coming weeks that it also inhibits um, EU 
um, exporters into the UK as well. So it, it, in terms of the wider picture, uh, this is something that we believe is a, is a necessity. But in terms of the RSC interface, um, where there is the will to try to eliminate uh, veterinary checks as much as we possibly can uh, through some sort of bespoke arrangement. Um, ultimately, the cleanest way of doing this is through a, a veterinary agreement. Um, and it is absurd that the UK um, is more or less adhering to the exact same standards as the European Union. Um, but is uh, foregoing the opportunity to have that formally recognised as part of an agreement. And in essence, it's punishing itself as a whole, but also creating huge difficulties down in the RSC as a consequence um, of that. And uh, so we see that as being a, a major uh, gap that does need to be addressed. And we hope, probably more in hope than expectation, we think uh, that the, the new incumbent, Liz Trust, uh, take, has taken over from David Frost, um, should uh, take the, the opportunity uh, to have a reconsideration of that. And even if they end up putting in place only a temporary agreement for a couple of years, that at the very least will buy us some time to consider whether we can develop a more workable bespoke option just for the RSC uh, situation. Uh, but we, we do have the, the, the problem that the UK is determined to try to um, develop as many free trade agreements uh, with the rest of the world to try to slowly compensate for what's lost with the European Union and uh, wants to maintain this regulatory freedom uh, to, to do those um, uh, as, uh, uh, with as much freedom as they can, though with a, with a veterinary agreement they, they can still make a, a number, number of deals anyway, so it, it, it wouldn't entirely be mutually exclusive. Um, also, we, we very much welcome what happened in terms of the breakthrough in medicines uh, before Christmas. That's something we've been working on uh, very strongly um, over the past number, number of, of years. I mean, first of all, in, in calling for the grace period itself um, and then calling for a, a bespoke solution. Uh, in that regard, we have always um, recognised that the European Union were determined to reach a solution on that issue and they weren't going to um, allow themselves to be painted in their corner. Um, on that um, very particular um, point. Um, the third uh, issue I want to highlight is around governance, um, which is perhaps an area that hasn't really got as much attention in the negotiations at present compared to some other issues. Um, and by that, I don't mean the issue around the European Court of Justice, which is very much a red herring. Uh, it hasn't really been an issue for any local stakeholders here in Northern Ireland, uh, but was more of an issue for David Frost and Brexit extremists and some sort of outmoded 19th century version of sovereignty. But even then, we've seen the British government softening its position in the past few weeks, uh, which is, is welcome in that regard. But what I do mean is around this issue as to how Northern Ireland elected representatives can have some consultative input to the development of EU law in relation to areas of the, uh, of the AK that will apply to Northern Ireland. We recognise that there is no perfect solution uh, in this regard, um, as Northern Ireland is outside the European Union, uh, and that there are limitations in, from in the terms of what the EU think is possible, uh, and also perhaps more significantly, the we, we're seeing a problem with the UK acting as a gatekeeper, wanting to be the the the, uh, the vehicle for discussions with the European Commission rather than Northern Ireland having its own voice uh, in that regard. Uh, but um, we, we feel that the proposals uh, in terms of seats for Northern Ireland, in terms of joint committees and joint consultative working groups and sort of hyper super consultation exercises probably don't go far enough in terms of addressing that particular issue. And I think it's one of the areas, um, if you are to see that the protocol bend, bedding in, uh, that we need to have some more formal means of addressing that democratic deficit so we can actually give the protocol uh, legitimacy. In terms of, of, just to conclude with this chair, in terms of the bigger picture, in terms of the politics of where we, 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 we now are on this one, I think things can go in, in two ways. Um, we have uh, two potential futures ahead of us. One is, is where we bed down the issues around the protocol. Um, we sort out the issues and the negotiations over the coming weeks. And the protocol may uh, provide a workable means for the foreseeable future for um, Northern Ireland devolution to be successful, for Northern Ireland um, to uh, benefit from access to the single market for goods, 
and also to benefit from its, its wider membership in the EU, or sort of the UK uh, economic um, area. And it provides a degree of political, political stability. And as an aside from that, the, the way unionism has reacted against the protocol in such vociferous terms and turned what could have been portrayed initially as an economic irritant, turned that into a constitutional crisis as being incredibly short-sighted. Um, in the sense that if I was a unionist, um, I would say that the protocol isn't exactly where we wanted to be, but it, it provides a means for managing the, 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 the Brexit that we wanted uh, in relation to, to, to Northern Ireland. Um, and we should, we, our job is to, make, is to make it work. And this brings into the, to the second scenario. If we see a, a situation where um, the DUP pull out of the assembly over the coming weeks, or even if the assembly limps on and there's another standoff after the, um, the, the assembly election. If we see a situation where the UK government continue to play some very irresponsible politics around Brexit and use Northern Ireland as their plaything in that regard, and that includes a reckless triggering of Article 16, which is not justified whatsoever in terms of our viewpoint, in the sense that this essentially provides further negotiations, but in a much more unstable environment. Um, that will that will lead to a much more uncertain situation for, for Northern Ireland. Um, so unpicking the protocol in a vacuum um, could see the assembly unravel. And it will also, shall we say, fuel the current constitutional debate ever further, in the sense that while obviously people had their own different constitutional aspirations prior to 2016, um, the constitutional question was largely parked in Northern Ireland in terms of being an active political debate. It wasn't something that people thought was going to be a live issue for, for many years. That has been changed dramatically um, in the past uh, few years, largely fueled by um, the protocol, sorry, fueled by Brexit. And the the um, also the, the standoff around the Irish language and the assembly and other and some other issues. So if we see further instability, and if we see a situation where more and more people are led to give up on the on the notion of Northern Ireland, that will lead to more and more people thinking about constitutional change. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. People are entitled to their viewpoints in that respect. But to to our party point of view. Constitutional change is, is better considered, and if it if was if it ever was to happen, to uh, better to happen in the context of stable political structures in, in Northern Ireland, rather than something that's fairly chaotic and, and uncertain. So the, the danger here is that um, if we see people playing fast and loose with the protocol and, um, and Northern Ireland, either from the DUP or the UK government, we could see a very uncertain remainder of this year and a very uncertain uh, few years and beyond as well. So in that sense, I would just conclude by saying that um, the next few weeks, therefore, are going to be very critical. And the, the consequences of getting this wrong are severe. But the prize, if we can get this right, in terms of landing the various aspects that are still causing contention, could be very significant for a flourish in Northern Ireland over the years ahead. So I'll leave it with that, Chair. Thank you very much.